Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you here. My name is Kimberly McKee. I'm the director of the Coochie Office of Local History in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Grand Valley State University. The Coochie Office of Local History's mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. Um, we're really excited about today's presentation with, Ka with Karen Sieber, uh, Great American Field Trip, the Omnibus College Experiment. This um, webinar is part of our Grand Rapids Time Traveler series. Um, please comment in the Q&A or chat if you have additional questions for our speaker. We may not get to all audience questions, but we hope so. And this webinar is also being recorded and will be available online later this week. Um, before we get started with our presentation, I'm excited to introduce our speaker. Karen Sieber is a public historian specializing in community history and the digital humanities. She's the current humanities specialist at the University of Maine's McGillicuddy Humanities Center and serves as the research and outreach coordinator for the Theodore Roosevelt Center and Digital Library. She's the creator of visualizingtheredsummer.com about the Red Summer race riots and lynchings of 1919, which is now used in classrooms on five continents. Her work has been featured by the American Historical Association, the National Archives, National History Day, The Conversation, Oral History Review, and in the upcoming book, Interpreting Labor History at Historic Sites, part of the University of Illinois' Working Class in American History series. So please join me in giving Karen Sieber a warm welcome, and I look forward to chatting with her during Q&A after her presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is research that I've been digging into for quite a number of years, but this is actually my first time getting to share it with the public audience. So this is as much a treat for me. Let me get my screen up here. Let's see. There we go. So uh, as was introduced, I will be talking today about the Great American Field Trip, the Omnibus College Experiment. Uh, I myself am a lover of road trips. It's how I best understand the world is being at the actual place. So I'm, I'm a public historian, so I love a historic site. But I love, you know, learning about differences between different regions and the people and the culture and the food. So um, when I want to understand America, that's that's how I do it. And so throughout the years, I've done, you know, multiple month long road trips and cross country train trips, uh, which has kind of developed a love for me of um, kind of why we travel, what we get out of travel. Um, so a number of years ago on a road trip myself uh, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, was at a bookstore called uh, Jim Reed's Used Books, but it's also known by its uh, other name, which is the Museum of Fond Memories. And it's kind of part bookshop, part junk shop. And I came across this scrapbook on the right. Uh, excuse my dog here if you hear him. Uh, so I came across the scrapbook on the right, which is for a group called uh, the Georgia <coughs> enough, called the Georgia Caravan, which was a traveling high school that existed in the 1930s. And the more I um, kind of tried to find out information about this school, I realized that it was actually a copycat of an earlier venture called the Omnibus College. Uh, so I have since now come across numerous scrapbooks of uh, students who attended the Omnibus College. Uh, this is one of them here. So you can see every student was given this scrapbook to, uh, to collect brochures and papers and photographs and newspaper clippings of their time on the road. And so most of the items that you will see in today's presentation are taken from these scrapbooks. So the word Omnibus College itself is just fascinating to me. Most people might be aware of omnibus as an adjective um, of or relating to or providing for many things at once or containing or including many items. And so very much this school takes that to heart. Um, it is kind of this overview of numerous oh. topics, um, but it's this great play on words too, because for those of you that are unfamiliar, uh, the word bus actually comes from omnibus. And so it used to be, um, the name for kind of a traveling public uh, vehicle. And so they've combined these two ideas. Uh, and the uh, 
Omnibus College was started by a scientist. His name was Dr. William Goldsmith. He started it in 1922. It ran for about a dozen years. It was um, umbrellaed under Wichita Municipal University, which is now University of Wichita. And it combined classwork and lectures with on-site learning. Uh, so the students and faculty came from all over. So it was open to far more than, uh, than just folks from, from Kansas and their faculty as well came from uh, all across the United States. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, over this 12 year period, there was over 5,000 students that called themselves omnibusters. Uh, and this is really the first time that you see class field trips being used and kind of this, this type of experiential learning um, being used outside of the sciences. Um, so field trips themselves are a new concept within education, um, kind of the turn of the century with um, kind of a return to nature movement and, um, and the Chautauqua movement. And there were all of these um, scientists that were encouraging people to get out into the field, especially when it came to things like geology. Um, so this kind of flipped that script and, and took the entire college on the road. So students could join expeditions that were six to eight weeks. Um, this, it was generally between 150 and $175 over those years. And that would cover all of their transportation, their tuition, all of their admission, uh, food along the way. These omnibusters uh, were unique in the fact that the vast majority of the students were teachers themselves or were education majors. Um, so these were teachers who taught during the year who would take these classes during the summer um, or they were still in their undergraduate career um, and taking these classes um, as kind of a cutting edge method of learning about education. So it primarily was female students, um, but not exclusively. So there was um, roughly 15% or so of the students were males. Uh, it also included a number of school superintendents. So, um, you know, people running entire K through 12 systems that were interested in implementing something similar. Uh, initially, most of the students came from the plain states and even throughout the years, you see definitely um, heavier attendance from places like Nebraska and Kansas and even um, quite a number from Wyoming and Idaho. But uh, students come, came from uh, over 40 states over the years. So this really was um, a case of, um, you know, it wasn't as tied to the University of Wichita as it could be. So the, um, students from all over the country at different universities were were taking advantage of this. The faculty members too came from all over. So um, you might have someone teaching at a rural K through 12 school teaching alongside someone from Harvard or University of Chicago. Um, a lot of these educators were at the top of their field. And so like this, um, the famous sociology school out of University of Chicago, um, the Park School. So these are um, you know, sociologists who are already thinking about place-based learning and about really kind of incorporating yourself into culture, um, into neighborhoods and communities as, as an observer. The students had an opportunity to take a number of different classes um, that were paired with sites that they would visit along the way. So within history, for instance, they um, went to various battlegrounds like Shiloh, they visited underground railroad sites um, in Maryland. They went to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, um, numerous sites tied to slavery. Um, but it was also, you know, the, the founder himself was very much interested in science. And so you see a lot of the stops related to scientific museums, um, to museum biology, as it was called at the time. Um, and also getting out into nature, um, up into the woods of Maine or studying the marine life in the Atlantic, um, plant life in the Ozarks. The, a lot of the inner city uh, locations were really tied to both, both sociology as well as literature and art. And so um, 
every city that they went to, they would visit a different immigrant community. Um, when they were in New York, they visited Sing Sing Prison, but they also visited more rural communities. So um, they went to sharecroppers cabins in the Delta, um, visited communities in Appalachia, um, lumber mills and kind of temporary settlements up in Maine. Um, so it very much, they were kind of trying to get an idea of the scope of the American population at the time. Uh, I myself would have loved to have attended some of the classes that were based on literature and art and culture and religion. So they did um, like Nathaniel Hawthorne's house. They um, went to the Statue of Liberty and were talking about sculpture. Uh, went to theater on Broadway, but also smaller um, theater groups across the United States. Um, I think it's particularly noteworthy to mention that they spent a good amount of time in Harlem. And you have to keep in mind, this is the late 20s. So we are kind of, you know, at the height of, um, of the Harlem Renaissance. And so they went to, for instance, Augusta Savage's studio, if you're familiar with a just remarkable African-American sculptor. They also went to uh, Abyssinian Church, which is the center of kind of Black religious life in New York City at the time, uh, sat in on lectures and sermons. So this was, um, they very much were, were not looking from afar, but, you know, doing as much as they could to fully, you know, immerse themselves into different neighborhoods and situations. A number of the classes were also centered, or a number of the lectures were also centered around commerce. Um, so the scrapbooks include things like ticker tape from the New York Stock Exchange. Um, they visited Chicago stockyards, as well as, um, you know, looking at our natural resources. <clears throat> so the um, St. Lawrence Riverway, the Mississippi River, the role that both of those have in the American economy at the time. Um, as well as new experiments. And so they were in Muscle Shoals kind of right at the start of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, and they also visited kind of smaller farms and plantations, um, packing houses, cotton mills, um, and really learned about the jobs that people were doing, about those resources, about what it meant for those regions. The logistics, of course, were... Uh, were a little a little tough. Um, and if you can imagine, in like 1932, for instance, there were 700 students that traveled that summer. Uh, there's only 20 something students per bus. And so they would have to go on numerous cycles. So five or six buses would leave at once and a staggered group would leave shortly after. You know, 1920s is it's before the interstate system. It's before chain hotels. Um, even a lot of the places that they're going to, even um, you know, coming across a gas station might be a little difficult at the time. Um, the students very much roughed it, so they were not going city to city and staying in hotels. But they would rather the whole autocade would pull into a huge field. Um, all of the tents would be set up, so there is. Um, in addition to all of the students traveling, there was another bus load or two filled just with staff. Um, so even the endeavor of every single night setting up that many tents of how much effort and coordination that took or cooking for that many people on the side of the road. Uh, so they really had it down to a science over the years. Most of their employees stayed with them year after year. Um, some of the employees came back as students themselves. Uh, because a number of these students on the trip were educators um, and women, um, many had to bring their children along the trip. So it, it wasn't just educators and students, but there was a handful of uh, very young children on the trip as well. Um, the students did all of their laundry. So usually every Sunday was a day to kind of catch up and rest and um, all the girls talk about putting their curlers in on Sunday uh, and do the laundry, but they were doing laundry, you know, on a washboard next to a river in, in the middle of a field. Uh, so this, they, were, they both had their small little groups. So they always traveled with the same students on the same bus. So this particular uh, scrapbook that I have mentioned of Alice Peterson's 
uh, she was in Autocade 4, which was part of Tent 3. And in her scrapbook is this wonderful list of all of the other girls that were in her tent. And so you see students here coming from Massachusetts and Wisconsin and uh, South Dakota, Montana, Virginia, all over the United States, um, traveling together, learning about each other's hometowns, learning about each other's schools, about their classrooms. Uh, most of these students stayed in touch throughout their lifetime. I have come across numerous instances um, in obituaries of women in their 70s, 80s, 90s that of the few moments in their life that get mentioned in this obituary, that they specifically mention their time in the Omnibus College and how much of an impact that had on their life. Um, and I just think that's so remarkable. If you think about this time period, 1922 is the first year that Omnibus College existed. Um, you know, this is just after women are getting the right to vote and these women are traipsing across the country and, uh, you know, visiting places that normally women wouldn't really have access to um, and doing so to obtain an, an education and studying topics that really were still a little taboo at the time. Um, so they very much um, you know, when they were in the South, it wasn't completely this celebratory um, experience in the historic sites and things they were going to. They were very much, um, you know, acknowledging the South's role in slavery and went to slave markets, went to, um, went to historic sites and, and cabins. So this is, um, you know, it's not like a surface level trip. Yes, they had a lot of enjoyment along the way, but these were really serious scholars that wanted to better understand um, not just America, but their place within America. Every day and every night, the group would meet together. So hundreds of students would kind of gather around the campfire um, and listen to the leader, William Goldsmith, um, or his wife, um, kind of lay out the plan for, for the day. <clears throat> the lectures that would be had, the sites that would be stopped at, um, any rules, you know, often there, um, a lot of the group would travel together, but they would have three days for exploring, especially in the city. So sometimes they would be dropping off hundreds of women in their early 20s into a foreign city. And the, these are women that are, for the most part, from like small farming towns in the West that are all of a sudden dropped in New York City with kind of an agreement to like, we'll see you back here at five o'clock. And, you know, these women had never ridden on a subway before, or it's just completely an entirely new world. Um, and they had just this ultimate freedom. Um, and it's just fascinating looking through their scrapbooks and, and seeing um, just how much life they could fit into just a few weeks. Um, you can see that all of the, the girls have uh, omnibus college jackets on. And so I've been trying to track down an Omnibus College uh, letter jacket. So uh, to add to my collection. Um, I now have five scrapbooks from the Omnibus College. And so uh, each student curates the material in a different way. And so I see a lot of the same things across the scrapbooks, but also um, you can tell if certain people were more into history or more into nature. Um, if there's more documents related to a certain topic than another. There's wonderful examples of um, brochures and guides and maps of different places that they visited. So this is, you know, visiting sites that are now part of the National Park Service or part of larger systems um, like Shiloh that are still kind of in an unorganized form at that time. And so looking at how Shiloh was um, kind of promoted to the public by this community group that was organizing it at the time um, before it was really uh, you know, a national battlefield kind of historic site. The scrapbook that I'm focusing on today is of Alice Peterson. Um, she's from Pocatello, Idaho. And I chose this particular scrapbook and year because she traveled in 1933. Uh, this year of the Omnibus College coincided with uh, the Chicago World's Fair that year, the, the century, century of Progress. And so normally there would be numerous 
routes, numerous cycles of students leaving, going different places. This year had a group from the West head, heading East and a group from the East heading West with convergence at the World's Fair in Chicago. Um, so students could take either tour, they could do kind of a combination of both. As you see on the map here, there was little spurs to both do side trips, but also for students to exit the tour and go back home. Uh, I'll get into a little detail about a few of the specific stops that they uh, went to, uh, but knowing that we have a crew largely from uh, Michigan and Chicago today, I'll highlight some of those stops. Um, students could join at 20 different states and hop on and hop off, and so it wasn't like everyone needed to go to Wichita to board the buses at exactly the same day. They had it all staggered and organized in a way that students could join and leave at different points. <clears throat> so in Alice's scrapbook, there's um, this large flyer here for the West Studies the East. Um, and they went to Tennessee and Texas, Missouri, um, and kind of headed uh, counterclockwise around the United States, up through the South, up through the Mid-Atlantic, um, New England, but also into Canada. Um, nearly every tour went for at least a few days into Canada. Um, <clears throat> on this tour, they went to Three Rivers and uh, Quebec and Toronto before coming back down through, uh, through Michigan. So you'll see here, they mention some of the stops that they visit in Washington, DC, or in Philadelphia, um, in New York. But here, uh, so here after leaving Canada, you can see they do the St. Lawrence River, Toronto. Um, they visit Detroit and the Ford factory. Uh, it's one of those locations in which they're studying commerce. Um, and then head on to the Chicago World's Fair. Um, but they very much are exploring the rest of the city. So the fair itself is not the only destination. They visit the stockyards, they visit uh, Marshall Fields, do a little bit of shopping. They visit immigrant communities and um, aid societies like the Hall House. Um, they go to open air markets like uh, Maxwell Street Market where all of the immigrants shop, uh, visit kosher delis. Um, this is you know, just an entirely new world for these girls that, as I mentioned, grew up on farms in the middle of nowhere. Um, the Eastern tour that she took, here's a little bit closer look at the states and um, cities that they visited. Uh, most of the sites in the South that they visited were related to commerce. And this was you know, at this time period, the South is still kind of trying to somewhat recover, at least in public perception from the Civil War and kind of trying to repaint itself as um, we are not this backwards place, we are a site of industry. Um, and so you see a lot of a lot of the stops that they take there um, are related to cotton mills or are related to farming. Highlighting again a little more of the uh, the local stops that they took in, in your area, they did uh, vineyards across Michigan. They went to wine cellars, they went to flax fields, um, went to Detroit and the factories, but also the Ford Village, um, went to the sand dunes. If everyone's, anyone's ever been camping out at the sand dunes, that was where they camped at the night. Uh, and so it, it was kind of part, uh, part education, but part enjoyment. You know, they would occasionally go to an amusement park or, or somewhere else. Um, and especially the World's Fair itself, um, kind of that, that spectacle was, um, was quite exciting and something new for them. I, um, you know, every scrapbook that I find, I, I come across them on eBay and uh, junk shops. I'm just always fascinated by what each person collects. And so going through Alice's scrapbook, I get to the section on Maine, which is where I now live. Uh, and she has 
plant life from 1933 pressed between the pages of her scrapbook that are still green. I mean, it's like, you know, the very first time getting the scrapbook in the mail and flipping through the pages. Uh, it was just a delight to come across these flowers and leaves and ferns uh, from 1933 that she so lovingly preserved among the photographs and news clippings. The legacy is kind of untold. Um, across the year, as I mentioned, there was, I actually believe over 6,000 omnibusters, but at least at the time of this piece of marketing, over 5,000 omnibusters. And they called each other omnibusters. Um, ask one who has been one. Their theory was that they barely needed to advertise at all, that if you just asked anyone who took part in this endeavor, that they would immediately recommend it to any other student, any other educator. Um, and so they listed all of the places that everyone came from. So maybe if you were an educator from Ohio interested in doing something similar, you would know exactly what teachers to reach out to. Along the way, um, one of the other classes that they took was a class in journalism. And so on the road, as they were traveling, they would also put together a newspaper and print it along the way and drop off copies in different locations. And so, um, you know, members of just the general public would come across copies of the newspaper and read these articles about these fascinating women and this caravan of buses that are traveling throughout the United States. Um, and it was kind of hot news at the time. Uh, so I have hundreds of newspaper articles shared about um, just the amazement of local communities about just kind of this army of, of educators showing up in town. Uh, there were, you'll see here at the bottom, this little uh, caption, if it isn't the Omnibus College, it isn't an Omnibus College. So there was, because of the popularity of this initiative, there were quite a number of copycats. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, I didn't first learn about the Omnibus College, but about a copycat high school uh, called the Georgia Caravan. And so this, rather than students starting in the West and traveling to the East primarily, this had students from the South traveling to the West. Um, and it just kind of flips this idea of, um, or it very much aligns with the idea of see America first. <clears throat> when a lot of people were traveling to Europe, there was this campaign across America of you do not need to go somewhere else to see the wonderful sights of the world, to see the natural wonders, to go to places of culture that it can be done right here in the United States. So these students started uh, in Atlanta, and uh, took a loop all throughout the South, through the American Southwest, visited numerous uh, Native American reservations uh, throughout California. They um, visited uh, some of the missions, they visited uh, historic sites, but also, uh, you know, I mentioned that the students, you can tell what's important to them by how they curate their scrapbooks. And so, keeping in mind that the Georgia Caravan was not educators, but it was a bunch of high school girls. Every Georgia Caravan scrapbook that I come across, rather than starting on page one with the start of the actual trip, most of them start their scrapbook with Los Angeles. Uh, the girls on the Georgia Caravan actually got to spend time with Clark Gable, uh, numerous other members of Kind of Hollywood high society. They went to Catalina Island. Um, so for them, kind of going to California was, um, you know, they really thought they were something special. Uh, and, you know, to play in the surf with California surfer boys. And so all of their scrapbooks are, are very much not as related to, uh, to the classwork and to this great ephemera from different uh, public history sites but it instead is um, you know, photos on the beach with their friends and uh, photos uh, you know, of, of Hollywood. So it's just interesting to see just in that five, six, seven year age difference between the two groups of students, um, how they curate their, their scrapbooks. So this group, as I mentioned, the Georgia Caravan went west 
And it is a very different version of America and of progress and industry than, um, than the students would see in the reverse. So um, I was fascinated by this brochure for the Boulder Canyon project. So before it's even the Hoover Dam, before it's completed even, um, it still was already kind of an attraction for travelers. Las Vegas itself was only a few thousand people at the time. So it was not kind of this huge mega site of gambling that we think of now, um, but really kind of built somewhat um, around and due to uh, the Hoover Dam. On the following page here, you can see an ad um, to stop and visit uh, Ramona's marriage place. If anyone is familiar with this old, uh, the love story of the ages. It's, uh, so this was a popular book, um, kind of turn of the century and early century. Uh, and so even though it's kind of this work of, of fiction, they're trying to place it in these real places in uh, Old Town San Diego. They also visited Agua Caliente. Um, for those that are not into travel history, this was, um, it was a casino and a dog track and a spa and Hollywood's kind of who's who would go down there. You could see it was like dinner and a show. It kind of was the Vegas before Vegas existed. So these high school students from Georgia and Tennessee and South Carolina were going to Agua Caliente. They were going to the dog races. They were um, seeing Hollywood stars in these shows, but they also visited, as I mentioned earlier, Native American communities, um, which looking through kind of the programs and ephemera from this, a lot of it is kind of problematic with how the Native American communities are, are portrayed. And so some of the dances that they were doing were completely made up, um, but other ones were very much grounded in Native American culture. And so it still was this learning experience. And I'm just, I was fascinated by the fact that um, quite a number of the students that collected brochures from this particular stop all um, had autographs, wanted autographs from the performers in, in the powwows, in the dances. And so you see a lot of, um, I think there's eight or 10 different names here of the performers from, um, I believe this year was 1934, that the Georgia Caravan, that this particular um, Georgia Caravan scrapbook is from. So this just really has me thinking about what would it look like to recreate the Omnibus College today, whether that would be in person or virtual, you know, it's just completely a different world. Um, so many places would change if you were to go there today or would be interesting to look at for a completely different reason. So sites of commerce, we might no longer be going to cotton fields or mill villages, but you know, perhaps we're going to Silicon Valley or Research Triangle Park or looking at um, different ideas of what commerce is and, um, and what can be commodified. Historic sites too um, can be expanded upon. So while the earliest trip, you know, was kind of heavy on the battlefields and heavy on the revolutionary history and the founding fathers, historic sites now you could visit, uh, you know, the location of the Stonewall riots. You could visit civil rights sites throughout the South or better yet civil rights sites that don't get talked about that are in the North. Visiting immigrant communities, it might, not be happening in the same neighborhoods in New York or Chicago that it was before, but perhaps you're visiting, uh, you know, Muslim communities in Michigan or, um, you know, immigrant communities that are living in North Carolina working on pig farms. This is where, where immigrants settle and, and the types of work that they are doing has changed over the years. Um, so how can we best highlight the immigrant experience now? Even nature itself has changed. So if you can imagine most of these places that the students were traveling through would be hours and hours and hours of nothingness that have now been replaced by 
suburbs and billboards and uh, you know roadside attractions. Uh, the highway system itself was not established yet. So the original trip, the road was a little rough and a little slow going and um, lots of flat tires, lots of washed out roads. So even just the ease of traveling and how travel has changed, has changed. Um, you know, we now have chain hotels and fast food and Yelp and Google Maps and all of these things to make it easier, but does that necessarily make it better? Um, so I think if we did kind of re-envision what this school could look like, um, I think, you know, it's the idea of the original Omnibus College and it gets these educators kind of in a variety of different types of locations and circumstances. Um, and how they shared that with the world was through that Omnibuster newspaper. So I think today, if we had students perhaps use Instagram or YouTube or some other channel um, to share the different sites and the different things that they were learning with a broader audience, so that it's not only the students that are on the trip that are learning, but it's the greater public as well that is kind of learning about the complexity that is America and American history and American geography. But it also could make for a really interesting virtual trip. Right now, as we are all homebound and doing a lot of virtual events, what would this look, look like using nothing but uh, you know Google Maps and Google Street View and digital archives, digital newspaper databases? Is there a way of still gaining this some the same understanding and moving through time and space like that um, that could be done in a virtual manner? It's there's so many other things to think about. I mean, how if it were, you know, if it was similar in that it was students from numerous universities, faculty members from numerous universities, what would that look like, um, you know, from a collaborative standpoint? Who is the one group that is overseeing it? Who's providing the credits? How would the payments work? You know, even the legality now, I think a lot of the things that they could get away with before would require, you know, countless. Uh, you know, releases of students signing away their life, that I, I think it would just, it's become so much of a more complex world that operating kind of a similar endeavor might be difficult. Uh, figuring for inflation, the $175 cost from the past today would be, I should have looked it up again, I think it's around $3,000 or so which would actually be quite difficult to do for a seven or eight week trip, um, or just the difficulty of finding a place to set up that many tents for the night. Um, and so does it look like something different? Is it a smaller group? Um, is it perhaps, you know, eight or 10 students that are traveling, you know, in a large van that are experiencing it that's a little bit easier to manage? Um, is it all students from one school? Do students have to apply? Is it kind of like a fellowship, like an experience? Um, if it can't be done in a proper way, is there another way of still kind of allowing students to experience this that's, you know, maybe not tied to credits? Is it almost like a scholarship or a fellowship that they could win um, to be able to go on this trip? Or it'd be interesting to allow students to design their own trip and argue for why certain stops should be um, should be visited or should be skipped. Uh, I you know I think there's so much potential for this type of education. Students today are very much hands on. They're very much interested in experiential learning. They want that like Instagrammable moment. They want. Um, and they truly want to understand the world and each other. Um, I think this generation is incredibly engaged with the world around them and I think would benefit from this. You know, I constantly hear complaints from students that they're always just being lectured to, that especially in the Zoom world, it's like they're just standing there static on the other side of the screen and they don't really get a chance to dig into information. Um, and so I think if there ever was the ability to create something similar to this, um, 
just the power that it would have to to bring any number of topics to light, whether that's social justice issues or climate change, you know, even the scientific classes are going to change a decent amount in the modern world. So how can we update this idea that was so powerful for, you know, over a decade and, and make it something modern and useful to students today? So I think that's probably a good place to stop. Great. Karen, thanks so much uh, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have received um, a few audience questions. I also have my own questions, but before I get to my questions, I want to start with the uh, audience questions first. Um, so we do have a question um, thinking about the fact that Wichita State did not integrate until 1959. And so thinking about um, that then so this is a long question so just bear with me um so was that college white only too so about with sites such as the underground railroad or the church was it about an integrated future or did it really did the omnibus college programs did they inadvertently or maybe explicitly reinforce segregation um and then the the third part of this question, um, in the scrapbooks, have you seen evidence about whether these students were conscious of sort of the white supremacism in either the North or the South? Yeah, so all very good questions. Um, it definitely was, um, as far as I know, all of the students were white students, um, but it there was never anything to, uh, to exclusively limit African-American students. But I do wonder if it, it operated separately from the University of Wichita, but they would like slap their logo on stuff. And but ultimately, it um, operated as its own entity. And so it, but I imagine was still kind of limited. You know, if I imagine at least some of its funding, or um, you know, it, it's definitely still tied to the university in a weird way. And so I imagine that that would have limited, even if they wanted to, that there likely would have been pushback. Um, there, yeah, I think the students are, you know, the things that come across in the scrapbook in a way shows me that they are quite, um, quite empathetic and aware of the black experience, but some of it also is kind of problematic. And so there's, there's quite a number of photos of these white women, perfect hair all done up, you know, fancy outfit heels in the middle of the Mississippi Delta, like with their arms around like sharecroppers children. And um, it almost, it for some reason reminds me of, you know, problematic like Instagram photos of people that are, you know, taking photos in front of like the Holocaust Memorial or things like some of it, you know, I try to place myself in the time and place of these women and who I'm sure didn't see it as being problematic at all, but with, you know, nearly a hundred years of, of removal here, looking at quite a number of the things in the scrapbook, um, I find is problematic now. Um, but I would, you know, I think one of, one of the perks of, you know, if this could ever be offered again, would be the way that we could expand this and just, you know, what would the omnibus college look like today with a more representative student base? Um, not just in race, in class, in interest, you know, if it wasn't only education majors, um, I think that it would just make it an even more powerful experience to be able to have those conversations after visiting, you know, like an Underground Railroad site, to be able to have a conversation around the campfire later that night to really dig into it and use it as an opportunity to, to talk about the Black experience, to talk about problematic ways in which history is remembered or forgotten or ignored. So I, and I think, you know, even the virtual, you know, a virtual recreation of this would also be more inclusive to students who could not take this trip for a number of other reasons. Um, so students with disabilities, for instance, just being able to take it from wherever, um, working students, students who are parents, to be able to you know, log on from a computer and um, 
and visit uh, visit Muscle Shoals today remotely. So I think, you know, for however many reasons that technology can be problematic and, you know, and curse its name at least once a day, that there's so many reasons that technology is just fabulous for connecting people and ideas and sharing information, especially now in this kind of you know, where people think that facts are not facts, to be able to use historic documents and places and moments and people in history to kind of bring to light um, different experiences and um, bring to life the classroom a little bit, you know, that the textbook is is not doing the trick anymore with, with quite a number of subjects and students really are wanting to engage with all of the information that's in there, just not the way that it's presented. And so whether this or something else, there's, I think it's an opportunity to, to think differently about, about how we share information with each other. So um, to our other audience question, what led to the closing of this school? Um, I, as far as I can tell, money troubles. Um, you know, you have to keep in mind, this is in the middle of the Great Depression. So the fact that they're existing for 10 years at all, when their primary base is uh, folks from the Plain States that are themselves fleeing the, the Plain States for elsewhere, this, uh, you know, it's, can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the end of that question again? So just in terms of the closure of the oh, program. Yes. Um, and so, and yeah. so, in 1934, there are a couple of newspaper articles that mention money troubles, like they would get to a city and not have like quite enough money to pay for a certain thing. Um, there were students that had to go home early at one point. And so it seemed that 33 was a huge success and 34 quickly fell apart. And by halfway through the summer, um, that it just couldn't sustain itself anymore. But that's a good number of years into the Great Depression. So um, I'm surprised that they lasted that long. Um, Georgia Caravan was similar. They started later, but uh, 1929 to 1935. So about the same time period. Uh, 1930s are a little bit different, but once you get into 1940s, you know, it is kind of the height of you know, the, the interstate system is being built and everyone wants to travel and all the GIs are coming home, you know, and GI Bill and everybody's doing great and everybody's buying a car. And, you know, throughout the 1950s, really the American road trip becomes such, it's not as much of like an anomaly by that time, but really in the 1920s, this is, this is an exception. I mean, this is like numerous newspaper articles of people writing just about the group coming through town you know, small farming communities of like three, 400, and all of a sudden there's 12 buses of students, you know, that are pulling into town. It's like the biggest thing that's ever happened there. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, I've not been able to, Wichita State has a single file of information about the Omnibus College. So it's a handful of, I have more information on my shelf behind me than Wichita State has on the Omnibus College. So that is limiting. Um, I've not been able to come across the papers of either Goldsmith or his wife. Um, no living descendants, at least not in that direct line. And so I would love to have more information about exactly what happened and, um, and especially on their finances side, because um, it seems even, even for the time, it seems like quite a good deal um, to get tuition and travel and entry to all of these places for, for $175. Even if it was out of reach to most Americans at the time, it still seems like um, quite remarkable that they were able to do it so affordably. Mm -hmm. So thinking about, and I really appreciated you including, I think it was the map from 1933 from the one um, woman's scrapbook. Um, it looked like they stopped in St. Joseph and Battle Creek as they were going between Detroit and Chicago. Um, I'm wondering, did you uncover any, like, were there any information in any of other women's scrapbooks or in any of the other sources that you found about sort of 
other things that they might have done beyond sort of seeing like the sand dunes. I'm guessing they stayed at the sand dunes when they were in like right around St. Joseph and that sort of thing. Um, did folks um, venture into other parts of Michigan at all um, and maybe go a little bit further north toward they, sort of Grand Rapids? They did not. Um, and there was only two years that I could come across that they even stopped in Michigan at all. So every year's route was a little bit different and the stops were a little bit different. And so while like Philadelphia, New York and Chicago were regular stops, everything else varied. And so sometimes they would not come through Canada that way. Um, but there was one year where they went up through Minnesota and did around that way. Um, so no, most of, as far as I can tell, most of the places that they visited in Michigan were um, related to commerce though. So they were visiting flax fields, they were visiting uh, the Ford plant. They, um, it, so it all seems to be things that are tied to industry. Um, okay. No, I was just, I was just curious, but also I think thinking too about, cause you were saying how folks could get on and off at different um, mm -hmm. stops. And because of the way sort of the omniboosters, which I love that word, but you know, because of how the omniboosters were also sort of writing and creating their own newspaper and sharing it with communities that they stopped by. And then I'm assuming, you know, like you were saying, communities were also writing about them. Did folks from any places out East or even I guess out West, if you took that route, did, did any of those women and educators want to join the omnibus? college as it was traveling around or is it still mostly do you see what I'm saying sorry mm -hmm. I think so um so you were not able to just join as it came around but they often had like all of the marketing and everything so they would like leave a little brochure that had like an envelope attached to it with a little form where you could sign up and and that sort of thing but um no it really was word of mouth um they had reunions every year and so almost like conferences and 12 or 15 of them. So different locations across the country. And then whether it was your year or other years, almost like a, you know, an alumni group that meets for a university would meet across the country in different areas. And so these educators would meet, but then also sometimes bring friends with them and other people to the meetings to then kind of get other people excited about the idea. Um, most people, as far as I can tell, that went on the tour, went on the tour because they knew someone else who went on the tour. Um, if you can imagine, you know, as I said, they lived, most of the women, in fairly small towns. And so in a town, if you can imagine like a farming town in South Dakota where there's not a woman who's been out of the state, let alone has been you know, exploring the city and going to Broadway and going to the Statue of Liberty. And so they would come home and even within their own communities, it was recognized how remarkable this experience was. And so the one teacher would come home to their school, implement some local class trips, you know, just within their own town, within their own community, um, within the forest behind the school to use those same ideas, which would then kind of encourage other teachers at that school to use those ideas. And, you know, eventually there's enough people doing it that museums and other people are catching on. So museums initially weren't, you know, wouldn't have, you know, a public educator or people that are doing just like K through 12 tours and that kind of thing. Museums and historic sites were kind of, I don't wanna say they were inaccessible, but it was definitely catering towards a certain clientele. It was not, uh, you know, poor farmers' daughters from Wyoming was not their key demographic. So even just, I like to think about how just these early years in travel, whether related to Omnibus College or not, kind of influenced how we travel today, how historic sites and um, roadside attractions and even, you know, even the kitsch roadside stuff just how much that was influenced by the early years. It's changed so much how we travel, why we travel. So now it is so much tied to pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. But in the past for hundreds of years, it's we have traveled to learn. This is why people have explored the world. It's why people 
want to go west, it's to find new things, discover new things. Um, and while that in itself has countless problems when talking about colonization and decolonization, um, it ultimately is what fuels people to, to get to know the rest of the world is for some sort of better understanding of something. Um, and, and now travel is very much like I want to go on the beach and relax for a week. And not that some people don't travel for other reasons, but it's why we travel and who, who travels and for what reason changes over time. So um, thinking then about sort of the impact this had on local communities, I guess, you know, logistically, um, what type of impact would this program have had on a community such as Grand Rapids? I realized they didn't stop in Grand Rapids, but, you know, thinking about them stopping even in Battle Creek or St. Joseph, you know, what kind of impact did having sort of these busloads of primarily single white women coming in do because I can you know was there any anxiety that you were going to see sort of a bunch of sort of potentially unchaperoned young women at the time uh, in your community? I expected to see so much of that um, when I first even learned about this group I expected to find so many articles that were like pushing back at all of these unsupervised women and there was very little of that which surprises me um, so I it's hard to gauge exactly um, what that kind of impact would be, but even just even thinking about it just from an economic impact, as I said, this is before chain hotels and McDonald's and everything. And so if you all of a sudden have hundreds of people showing up in your town all at once, and you know, the crew would sometimes arrive a few hours earlier, so they would, you know, secure everything to buy the meals. And so they would often you know, there's not not a Kroger and a Publix. Uh, it's they're going to local farmers. They're going, you know, they're they're buying what they can wherever they are to feed these students. So they would travel with like grains and and that kind of thing. But so much of um, their supplies and things just came from those local communities. Um, and then I we have time for one last question, and this is another question from the audience. Um, if given the chance for this program to be re resurrected in some kind of shape, right, whether it's virtual or um, face to face, uh, would you want to be part of that? Oh, yeah. No, I've actually tried to figure out, you know, I feel like if I ever, so I've thought about writing a grant for this. Um, but technically, I feel like University of Wichita should kind of have, have dibs on this, so to speak. And so do I, you know, is it some weird collaboration between the University of Maine and the University of Wichita, or is there some outside entity or, I mean, universities are so like territorial and claim based and whenever you have a big project, everyone kind of wants it to be theirs and have ownership over it. And so how do you make something that is that kind of collaboration. Um, and do it with with other institutions that are across the country. So yeah, I would love to collaborate with them, with public historians, um, and with faculty members from a variety of different fields. And so my idea of what a great trip to learn about America would be is going to be different from a sociologist, different from a climate scientist. And so how do we um, collectively choose the right sort of locations, the right stories, the right lectures? Um, to kind of let all of these disparate topics kind of find alignment and um, and be as powerful as they can be, but do so in a way that logistically makes sense. Like mm -hmm. I've just been creating a, a walking tour on campus with students and there's stories that I would love to include, but just the fact that it would take like an extra 20 minutes for somebody to scoot up there and add that stop, it would be the similar story here of like, and I think your like your question about why we're sites in northern Michigan not included. It's very much this kind of story that, um, you know, it might have cost them an extra $600 with that many students, that many trucks that, you know, to just scoot over and do one extra stop up here over there. So I think, you know, they had to do it in a way that made sense for time, for money, for 
for logistics ahead of time? Well, thank you so much. I'm just trying to also be mindful of folks' time today. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. As I noted at the beginning, uh, we have recorded this. This will be up on our YouTube channel by the beginning of next week. So thank you again, Karen. I feel like I've learned a lot. I know um, I'm, our audience enjoyed it based on their questions too. It was really exciting. So thank you so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. having me.